From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Max Williams, filling in today. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Today's episode is a doozy. We are diving back into the world of alleged cults, several of which you may have never heard of before now. Folks, please be aware that this episode or series contains descriptions of violence as well as serious emotional and physical abuse, sometimes against children. Uh, As a result, it may not be appropriate for all listeners, but we wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, And additionally, our legal department probably wants us to say in all but one of the cases we're discussing, Today, we're exploring allegations, not proven crimes. So with this in mind, we're also making space for responses to these allegations where appropriate. Uh, But before we get into any of that at all, we've got to respond to some allegations about us, folks. Uh, Matt Knoll, the rumor is that we don't just have a book, we have an audio book, and we're allegedly going on tour. I thought you were going to say we were a cult. Jeez. Well, you know, <laughs> we're a cult of personality, right? I suppose, in that we all have personalities and we hang out together and talk about spooky stuff. Um, but we're going to be doing that in person. Well, first of all, we're going to be doing that uh, virtually in audiobook form, uh, where you can listen to the entirety of our book, Stuff That I Want You to Know, available soon anywhere audiobooks are found. That's right. And the book releases on October 11th. And we're going to be celebrating by going on the road. We're going to be in Atlanta, Washington, D.C., and Plainville, Massachusetts. Check out the site StuffYouShouldReadBooks.com to learn more. And speaking of learning more, whenever we talk about organizations like this, cultic groups, you'll see why we're calling that them that in a bit, uh, we first have to talk about the C word. What is it about just the phrase cult that makes makes the concept so inherently controversial? Uh, Here are the facts. There's some tricky stuff about the C word, and the three of us have run into it uh, extensively in the past. We have a little list of related episodes uh, that we like to keep track of in in our show notes and uh, in this for this episode i just put there too many too many other episodes to name we have done a lot of work on cults as has the international cultic studies association uh, which attests that at least 2,500,000 americans have joined some of these cultic groups during the past 30 to 40 years which means that some people who joined groups during the 1960s 70s and 80s went on to have children who were born uh, or raised in these environments, um, highly controlling cultic environments. Yes, and if we want to define a cult, we can to an extent. Uh, let's give let's let's give a quote here from that same organization. A cult is quote a religion or religious sect generally considered to be extremist or false with its followers often living in an unconventional manner under the guidance of an authoritarian, charismatic leader. Check, check, check. I I do have to ask, though, the notion of something being false seems very relative. You know, I mean, one person, we always say one person's cult is another person's religion. It's very difficult, nigh impossible to prove the validity of one's religion, of any sort of deity or the existence of any kind of, you know, religious figure uh, from the beyond. So that term definitely throws me a little bit. I think the extremist part is a little clearer. And the idea of this controlling authoritarian guidance, typically under an individual or a small group of individuals that are kind of working together to exert control over their followers. Yeah, this is an interesting point. Uh, by false, let's uh, let's frame it this way. Uh, false doesn't necessarily refer to one's spiritual beliefs. And, you know, our longstanding policy on stuff they don't want you to know is that your spiritual beliefs are your own. Uh, 
instead false here seems to be referring to objectively disproven information. So, for example, if you say, I am starting, you know, the NCOB, New Church of Ben, and our belief is that when your physical body dies, uh, you are reincarnated as an item at the closest Taco Bell. That's fine. That's a spiritual belief. But if you were to say instead, um, the New Church of Ben believes that books are hoaxes. They don't actually exist. Anytime you thought you saw a book or a library, you were wrong. You were misled. Wake up, sheeple. Like that is demonstrably false because everyone has seen a book, even if you don't like them. Yeah. Those are just For items sure. from your local Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs> but we also see, you know, uh, uh, shades of that within fundamental Christianity, for example, uh, who, who some who claim that evolution is false. Uh, evolution isn't real or certain scientifically proven things are hoaxes. So, it, you know, it kind of the whole one, one person's religion is another person's cult still holds true. And there are these weird gray areas that we do have to dance around. But guys, um, it's a very interesting uh, area. How are you going to disprove that Jesus came from Venus and landed on a specific hill in England? Right. And why are you going to ruin someone's day if they believe something that makes them happy? That's, that's kind of the liminal space that I, I wrestle with personally. Um, it is important to note, though, that many organizations that have been called cults find the term profoundly offensive. They feel being labeled a cult diminishes their legitimacy, and it, it kind of attacks their beliefs. Uh, and that's, of course, you can see why people wouldn't want to be described as a cult. And for this reason, you'll see some groups calling cults unorthodox religions instead. Um, but as well-intentioned as that might be, I, I argue it still falls far short of the mark because there are groups that don't seem to have a thing in common with the stereotypical film and fiction idea of a cult. Fitness groups can be cultic. Life coaching organizations can be cultic. MLM, multi-level marketing outfits, can definitely be cultic. And with that in mind, it's best for us to center the definition of a cult on the tactics and practices used by a group rather than a specific set of beliefs. Yeah, and, and what are we talking about here? We've mentioned this before, especially I think most recently, maybe, guys, in one of our listener mail episodes where we've talked about um, any particular group that operates in a, a certain way, right? Uh, maybe it's not a religion at all. Maybe it's a juice company. It's a, a small cafe that specializes in juice or something like that. And additionally, maybe they don't even have some kind of official book or maybe 3000 books like one of the organizations we're going to talk about today. They just have some set of practices that make you as an adherent or someone who wants to be a part of the group go through all kinds of rigorous mental, emotional, physical things, tasks that are meant, well, I say, I think we say, are meant to control you as a follower. Yeah. Check out our video from years ago that still holds up how to start a cult. It walks through the different steps uh, that these organizations will use to control someone's body and more importantly, their mind. Uh, bonus points. You will see me successfully get our pal Chuck Bryant to join join a cult. Uh Probably should follow up with him on that. I, I think I left him hanging on the newsletter. But yeah, it, it it's true. It's almost content agnostic. And that is not to diminish, again, anybody's metaphysical or spiritual beliefs. It's just to say that what matters to the definition of a cult is, again, the tactics. You will have a leader who cannot be questioned. You will have very strict dictates about what you do in your day-to-day -day life, what you can eat, how you can spend your time, what kind of job you can or can't have, when you can sleep, or, in the amorous sense, who you can sleep with, who you can fool around with. Uh, you might be forced to not pursue a romantic interest, or you might be forced into a marriage with someone you don't know. Uh, and then also, your children will be controlled, uh, often brutally, in these sorts of environments. The big, big thing, restricting information. This is the key. 
This is how they keep you from uh, asking too many questions about Venus, for instance. Uh, and this, <laughs> that example is just stuck in my head. And then, you know, the big them versus us, insider versus outsider. Yeah, exactly. And that's the way they restrict your interactions with others, right? Be, and that's a part of restricting information that comes to you as a follower. Well, that includes even, you know, your your own family and loved ones. The idea of separating you from them and their influence because they are a threat. They are a grounding influence that has the ability to pull you out of this new reality that is sort of taking precedent over what others might argue is, you know, reality. Um, so the more they can do to separate you from those folks who might have influence to pull you out of this, the better uh, and more successful they can be at recruiting, you know, new members that are full adherents. Yeah, always be wary of any organization that treats all questions as though they are hostile interrogations. It's okay to ask stuff. It's actually it's a very good thing for humans to do in general. I mean, also, do cults get a bad name? Yeah, because you usually you don't you usually hear about cultic organizations when they meet with disaster. Heaven's Gate, the Manson family, the uh, the Flavor Aid massacre, Jonestown. But you don't hear about a lot of the groups of people who just got together because they share the same beliefs that may be or share the same aspirations that may be uh, don't vibe with the mainstream society in which they live, they're not abusing their members. They may not even necessarily be proselytizing, like going out and trying to convert. Uh, they may have no sinister intentions. They just maybe have some different holidays and some different opinions on what happens before you're born or after you die. Is that like being a big fan of fish? The, the band, I feel so. like that meets all you those things. You could say so. And maybe fish is the charismatic leader. They, they do did. good things. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah. good things and they're yeah, happy well. and they don't Magical even proselytize the people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've mentioned in the past, too, that I had some dabblings or encounters with the Baha'i Faith, which is a group that has, you know, if you look up Baha'i Faith, you'll see Google instance saying, is the Baha'i Faith a cult? And a lot of that stems from the, uh, the fact that the prophet, Baha'u'llah, is a relatively speaking modern figure, um, you know, certainly not ancient, like like the the you know mastheads of, of many other religions. And I found it just to be a very family oriented uh, group of, of people who were very kind. I didn't feel like I was trying to be uh, arm twisted into any kind of action or any kind of behavior or anything. Um, it was something that some friends of my my kid um, you know invited us into. We went to a few of their meetings, and it was lovely. Um, but that is a group that I think likely, in my opinion, unfairly gets that rap. Yeah, because it's easy to demonize or vilify those who have different beliefs. Tale as old as time. And of course, the Baha'i faith is arguing for things that everyone can agree are generally a cool idea. Don't be a jerk to people. Try to make the world a better place. You know what I mean? Another another religious group that uh, gets a lot of unfair bad press is the Sikh community. Uh, and the Sikh community, in I haven't met, of course, every adherent to that faith, but everyone I have met have been universally awesome. So you can't, uh, you can't, we have to be careful not to unduly judge people or to paint with a broad brush. But with that being said, with these important notes about how to think of organizations described as cults or cultic, we have to say, even with all those caveats, there are many, many, many more cults out there than you might have guessed. So I say we pause for a word from our sponsor. It's obviously Scientology, and then dive in. Here's where it gets crazy. Uh, and we're not talking about that that CIA ad. Uh, you guys hear about that? There's a CIA recruitment ad that's been running on our show. That's nuts. <laughs> mm -mm. You don't even have to be a Georgia Tech student anymore to get one of those, or, you know, MIT. They just send it to everybody. Careful. So, uh, so the, uh, the, the cults, though, I guess you could say factions of the CIA functioned as a cult during at certain times, right? Uh, cultic reasoning is what leads to wild stuff like MKUltra. But 
Today, when we're talking about obscure cultic organizations, we're talking about organizations that have been described as such, often by former followers or by uh, outsiders. It is incredibly rare for a leader or active member of one of these organizations to say, hell yeah, brother, we're a cult. Join on in, you know? And if there was someone who did that, I would probably hear their pitch because I prize the honesty in advertising. I'd be like, okay, well, you know, uh, we wanted to make it clear that in all but one case of what we're discussing today, these are active organizations. You can visit their websites. We have. Uh, you can even in some cases request uh, literature or learn more. What we're saying, what we're describing now is in no way an endorsement of these organizations, uh, nor is it us putting our opinion on this. We're, we're just dealing with publicly available info. And uh, to my knowledge, none of the three of us have been active members, thank goodness, of the organizations we're about to describe. Why don't we start close to home? There's one in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a, it's a political movement that's been described as a cult. The Black Hammer Party, which I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to start off with tongue in cheekness here, but I just can't not think of MC Hammer when I think of the idea of a hammer party. A hammer you know, party. I always think of parachute pants mm -hmm. and that sideways, you know, hammer dance move with the legs kind of bowed out. That is not what this is. Um, no, it, well, see, I think about the, the Black Panther Party for self-defense, but like a play on it, right? Uh, like Huey Newton styled on thing where it's the Black Hammer instead, because that's more... Uh, I don't know. It's aggressive. You can hold it. It's aggressive imagery, you know. Yeah, I was thinking of the uh, the hammers those low level bosses throw in in Mario games, but I yeah. But I might just have a case. They are of black Fridays. hammers. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, that's probably good. What's that black kind of like uh, seasoned steel, like cast cast iron? Mm -hmm. I guess those old school hammers and sledge hammers might have been made of. Um, but let's 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 do start right here in our in our home turf of Atlanta. You likely may not have uh, heard of, and I had not, and I live here uh, of the Black Hammer Party. It is a relatively young group uh, formed only as recently as 2019. Uh, the Black Hammer Party, aka the Black Hammer organization started as a collective of people who were disgusted um, by the ongoing systematic institutional racism of the United States, uh, the government, the police, all of these systems. And rightly so. I think we all share that perspective <laughs> to, to, to some degree or another. A hundred percent. Yeah. The, the founders here describe themselves as activists primarily. They are a collective of people who have backgrounds in what is called radical black separatist pro-segregation organizing. So the idea is that uh, to address the evils and the historical consequences of colonialism, uh, we one must organize the working class, one must decolonize by uh, making one's own community that does not suffer from the evils of racism. That is understandable, right? That's you don't need to believe in some God from Venus to say, yeah, let's get rid of bad stuff in society. After the murder of George Floyd and nationwide protest, the group experiences a significant rise in public profile and in active members. Uh, they also become uh, known for social media. I don't want to call them stunts, but they they become known for being quite adept at pulling the levers of social media and they can go viral with things. Hashtag no COVID. They once protested outside of the CDC in support of uh, Nicki Minaj because the Black Hammer Party was um, very much against COVID vaccination. And when Nicki Minaj uh, also came out on Twitter saying she was skeptical about vaccinations because of what happened to her cousin's scrotum, then and that's true. You can look it up. Then they went. I know. To, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a child. To, I'm, yeah, it is true. I I, uh, I just I'm telling our listeners that because it sounds so crazy, but it was these were crazy times. So they protest um, in support of Minaj, and they get a lot of um, attention for that. They're more front of mind to the average audience member, especially if you're here in Atlanta. And so their plan expands. 
and they say, hey, we're still going to stage protest, right, and speak truth to power, but we're also going to make a place of our own. Ben, did you notice, um, and and, uh, what are your thoughts around, you know, the black community being in general somewhat more hesitant around these kind of government, fast government rollouts of vaccines? Uh, It just seems like, you know, with the history of mistreatment of that community and, you know, things like experimentation and all of that over the years, that it makes sense that there might have been, you know, some trepidation uh, within that community and hesitancy to just accept that this thing is okay. Well, I mean, yeah, we talk about it in, uh, what a plug, what a great setup. We talk about it in our book, <laughs> the idea, like the, these ideas don't come from nothing. You know, people remember the horrors of Tuskegee and mistreatment of people of color in the medical community is far reaching and well known. And there are, you know, it, it's weird because we'll get into the leader of uh, this movement in a moment. We'll introduce him, but it was surprising to some observers that uh, this this founder of the Black Hammer Party announced that they were in league with the Proud Boys, who are more of a, uh, a further right organization. So the ideology gets muddy. Maybe you could call it Case of Strange Bedfellows, But yes, there was a lot of hesitancy and there remains a lot of hesitancy around uh, the vaccine or taking a vaccine. And it is because of um, mistrust of government entities. And it's also because of um, it's also because to an outside observer, you're saying, hey, there's so many other diseases that have been around for so long and there is no vaccine for them. Right. How did this suddenly get? fixed uh that the those are the i think the two pillars of vaccine hesitancy on um, black hammer uh was you know anti-covid vaccine and there were a lot of protest groups that were uh and they didn't agree on literally anything else except for that uh and maybe and maybe the importance of firearms uh but black hammer decides they're going to go to the rocky mountains and they're going to outside denver they're going to build their own utopia, a compound uh, with some specific ideological guidelines. They're going to call it Hammer City, by the way, which I think is a really cool name. Yeah, also sounds like a Mario level. I would play the Mario... Hammer City? Um, I don't know. Hammer City in the Rocky Mountains? Let's go. I, I'm into it. Is it near Rock City? Uh, <laughs> I see that That's too. a it's different, different place. Different uh, all right. Well, let, let's talk about how Black Hammer describes what Hammer City would be on their own website. Here, here are just a couple things. Uh, the purpose of Hammer City is to build this city and other cities for all people of color to be free. Sounds good. They want to return the land to indigenous people. Sounds good. Those who move to and live in Hammer City would be offered jobs, housing, food, and health care. And Black Hammer also states that in Hammer City, there will be no discrimination of nationality, gender, age, or mental and physical differences. Asterisk. There will be no cops, no rent, no coronavirus, and no white people. And that's the asterisk. That's <laughs> they said. Uh, uh, none of that. But that's, that's what a, a separatist movement, that, you know, that's one of the tenets of a separatist movement. And there are, you know, there's another group that I think could fairly be called a cult, which we might have to get into in another iteration, called the Creativity Movement. That Which sounds is, nice. Is it like Lego? They, 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 uh, sounds play, Play-Doh nice. based? So what are we talking here? <sighs> Crafts? It's so confusing. It, it is an atheistic, religious, white supremacist movement. Oh, no. It started in the 70s. That's not, that's yeah, not what I thought it was at all. And it's not super creative either, but their idea is that they will, um, they will unite all the people they consider white through this atheistic religion. So we're throwing out the example of the creativity movement to show that there are other there are other movements with those kind of goals of separation, right? According to what they see as their definition of race. And in the US at least, it is completely legal to find like-minded colleagues, buy some land, 
and live on it, right? It's completely legal to do that, and there's nothing wrong with it. So there's, you may not agree with their ideas, right, as espoused in Hammer City, but you don't have to visit. And if they're not hurting you, then it's okay. Now, would they get sticky with local law enforcement? Sure, right? Uh, because local law enforcement would come on the scene if there was a crime or something like that. Uh, like the Branch Davidians. I mean, look look how bad that can so. go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Would it be sticky if some group of white people does try to come in? Uh, you would probably use a private property defense at that point, right? Unless you incorporate it as a municipality. So you can see that they're, you know, it's kind of a, we're thinking big, we're being ambitious. We will figure out the details along the way because this is important to us. And one of the thought leaders of this group is a guy who was born Augustus C. Romain Jr., also known as Gazi Kodzo, uh, this person is a controversial figure to former members of the Black Hammers. Uh, You'll see them saying that under his leadership, the group transformed and became kind of, uh, well, the phrase I would use most often was abusive, uh, like a hotbed of abuse and toxicity. Toxicity is kind of a loosely defined term in today's parlance, but you know, stuff like holding people against their will, uh, forcing people to do stuff they didn't want to do. Yeah. And, uh, this soon boiled over, um, as the group encountered, uh, external criticism from other groups that you might, you know, on, upon first glance say would seemingly be aligned to some degree. Uh, for example, uh, Kevin Rashid Johnson of the new African black Panther party, um, Johnson reportedly accused the black hammer of being a conspiracy, uh, a secret right-wing conspiracy, an operation meant to sow division amongst leftist movements. Um, Also, the whole Hammer City thing didn't quite pan out. They did some fundraising. Uh, The group missed a deadline, which is usually a red flag, of May 14th to sign the paperwork for the land. On May 17th, the San Miguel County Police escorted the remaining members from off the property. They were not there legally because they had not done the deal. Yeah. And then things start heating up in Fayetteville, Georgia. This occurs in July of this year, July 19th. Law enforcement in Fayetteville get an anonymous phone call from this guy who says, I have been kidnapped. I'm being held against my will in the garage of this house. So the cops send a SWAT team to search the home. This leads to a standoff. SWAT arrives, they surround the structure, and they're asking questions via loudspeaker. Um, And the people who are inside are talking with law enforcement. Uh, There are about 10 people inside. Law enforcement is telling them all to exit. Uh, It takes some hours of talking, but eventually nine people leave willingly, and SWAT dispatches their robot, you know, one of their creepy, creepy law enforcement robots to search the house. And this is where they find the 10th person who is unfortunately dead. And they would deploy a device like this because of fears of there being explosives or booby traps of yeah. some kind, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when they, they found that 10th person, they appear, the the deceased person appeared to have died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, and that's what's been reported by police. Um, there, You'll find people writing on the internet, some former members, some others who are just commenting on it, that perhaps that was not the case, that it was not a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but those are allegations. Well, and it fits the narrative, you know, of of at least their perceived narrative that we are anti-police brutality, that we are here to protest the corruption in law enforcement. So for this to be like a martyrdom kind of event makes sense to fit their larger story. Um, but it doesn't seem to check out. Well, there are two versions of it. There are two versions of it. One that I've read online was that someone within the home shot and killed that 10th person who was there. And the other version is that police officers, SWAT team, entered 
and killed that person. That's that story is coming from Black Hammer and its members. That's what I mean. That's the it, it makes sense that would suit their their narrative, you know, for the the mission statement of, of their group um, and that it would potentially help rally support around them um, when they're kind of starting to <laughs> get a bit of a bad look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These incidents lead to Ghazi being arrested on a number of charges uh, and one of his one of his associates, a guy named Xavier H. Russian, is also arrested. That's R-U-S-H-I-N. You'll see why we want to clarify in just a second, folks. Uh, uh, it's important to note that neither of these individuals have been convicted of a crime at this point. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're clear about that. These are charges, not convictions. One last note. Something tells me we may return to the story of the Blue Black Hammers in the future. But one last note. The story is still developing this caught my interest. The feds may be investigating Black Hammer, or they have been investigating Black Hammer, but the reasons for doing so might surprise you. In July of this year, July 29th, just a few days after, after that standoff we mentioned, the U.S. DOJ, the Department of Justice, released information about alleged Russian influence on U.S. political organizations. And depending on who you ask, you'll find some people convinced that these allegations indicate the Black Hammer Party was receiving funding from a Russian individual with connections to the Russian government. So straight out of the, the Dugan cookbook, Foundations of Geopolitics. Well, also on, 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 on just a cursory glance of the Black Hammer website, uh, it is a hotbed of right wing political hate speech. <laughs> I just want to. Oh put yeah, that also out pretty anti Semitic. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's an article. The headline is, and this is not like reposted from some other site. This is written by someone who contributes to the site, presumably someone who's a member of the organization, uh, an individual uh, signing on as Oju. Marjorie Taylor Greene is right, and here's why. Um, you know, whatever your political leanings are, I think most of us that are somewhat moderate uh, can agree that Marjorie Taylor Greene is 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 a very toxic and, and nasty uh, individual in terms of the, you know, the things that she puts out there, the unfounded conspiracy theory that she helps, you know, proliferate. And, you know, it's just using these buzz terms. Like it says earlier this month, while former president Trump was in New York city, he had his resort home at Mar-a-Lago raided by sleepy Joe's FBI. Um, they, they go on to say your decrepit Bernie Sanders. They go on to call Joe Biden pedo Joe at some point. I mean, just a lot of, it's a lot of this very charged right wing, kind of 4 chan -y type language on here. So that part certainly yeah, doesn't sit right. Yeah, and also yeah. that's another point we talk about in the earlier video. And folks, this is a smart way to tell when an organization might be becoming a little cultic. The use of specific nomenclature, right? The use of initialisms, the use of acronyms, the use of jargon, that further brings you into the cognitive space and then further separates the them from the us, the ins from the outs, the ha uh, the nos from the no-nots. Uh, it's, it's insidious. I always think about titles, titles in an organization in that context, Ben, like as you're moving up the ranks or something, you attain these new titles. And if you don't know what that is, you're, you, there's a lot of explaining to do to we a third party, titles. right? That reminds me. <laughs> Sure. I'm always about it. Uh, just the last thing, the, the takeaway from this article or this uh, blog post, I guess, uh, the FBI has come for Trump. Who's next? Uh, just again, that that up that othering that that sowing distrust, you know, for the government and the idea that, you know, and again, the government deserves plenty of distrust, but this is very specific. Um, and then there's a picture of the FBI raid and the head the, the, the subhead is uh, or the little subtitle is the FBI raiding the Mar-a-Lago resort home of Trump in the darkness like the greasy cowards they are. Not exactly unbiased reporting. Yeah, that's true. And you can check that website out. Uh, we It's an unfolding saga, as we said. There's more to the story. We may return in the future, but that's some pretty deep water already. This organization is not unique, uh, and there are there's not really a shortage of former members who will tell you that there are dangerous things going on internally. Just before we move away from the, the Black Hammer Party, it should be noted that 
I believe it was Augustus, correct me if I'm wrong there, Ben, who was charged with sexual assault uh, of some variety. And there are other allegations of such things going on at the at the house and in other locations inside the Black Hammer party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some of the charges were related to sexual assault. Again, this is deep water. Uh, we're going to pause for we're going to pause on the Black Hammer party for now and follow up in the future. Let's try something different, right? We're we're talking about painful, disturbing stuff. So why don't we talk about something happy? But keep it scientific. That's where happy science comes in. <laughs> I love that. Is, that. is that like the creativity yeah. movement? <laughs> it's way less. Well, ah, uh, damn, kind of. <laughs> Do you get to make phloem? Do you get to make oobleck and bounce around upon it in your swimming pool? We're going to answer those questions and more right after this break. Get happy. Get science. <laughs> We've returned. Okay, that that last tagline wasn't my best, but uh, as you can tell, I am enamored of the name Happy Science. If you haven't heard of Happy Science, perhaps you're more familiar with its original name, the Institute for Research in Human Happiness. Sounds like a dream job, actually. That sounds really cool. Our, our story starts with the founder of the IRHH, or the founder of Happy Science, a guy who is known as... Ryoho Okawa, uh, born Takahashi Nakagawa in 1956. And this guy has this really cool moment in his origin story. He is a prestige, he's got a job, a Wall Street job. He's a trader at this pretty prestigious firm, and he even works in their Manhattan office for a year or so. And he, one day in the course of his career, on July 15th, 1986, Mr. Okawa has had enough. He quits. He quits a job that a lot of people would literally kill to have. Uh, so he quits. He walks away from those earthly concerns because he needs to focus on this organization, this happy science. He needs to, quote, bring happiness to humanity by spreading truth. That sounds good. Tell the truth. Make people happy. Those are two very positive things. It's, it's similar... Similar to David Icke in a couple of ways in the story he told us about, you know, he had his own thing. He was doing this thing and he got inspired one one moment and then he had to tell the world. Ugh, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it does sound innocuous the way we're describing it. But in this guy's case, this has been uh, building for a while in the background because he had kind of a second gig that was unrelated to his professional career. He was writing he had published several spiritual books wherein he claimed to, I think the phrase would translate to channel messages or communications from historical and religious figures who have passed away. Folks like Confucius or, of course, Jesus Christ, uh, who is a person that many new spiritual leaders apparently have in-depth conversations with. Oh, yeah. And you can see uh, videos of him channeling uh, political and religious figures. And I just have to say, it's quite fun. I quite enjoyed watching some of those videos. I kind of like the vibe. I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Your mileage may vary, but I, I enjoyed watching it. And I think, I think the guy, the vice journalist we're going to introduce, I think he enjoyed it too. So, okay. Okawa, spoiler alert figures out why he, of all people, is receiving these messages, these divine communications. It all goes down to El Cantare, uh, which is the, the real name of God, the highest God of earth, the Lord of all gods. Uh, followers of adherents of that happy science believe that this entity was born on earth 330 million years ago, and it's the same entity that gets worshipped at different times through different cultures and civilizations. And they're all naming the same thing. Whether they're talking Toth or uh, Osiris or Odin or Hermes, they're all talking about El Cantare. And Okawa, it turns out, is receiving these messages because he is this era's current incarnation. 
of the action of real God. Yeah. Fun fact uh, about the singer or El Cantare. Uh, he was once the ruler of Venus, former ruler of Venus. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's weird that they emphasize former. I wonder if the word Cantare, you say it's singer, maybe it's tight. Like there's the, the word cantor. You know, who's like a sacred singer in uh, in Judaism, or like who sings for religious cer ceremonies during like high holy days and things like that. Yeah, the I mean, the idea of the idea of the creator of everything being a singer, or that being a human way to understand it, it's it's quite beautiful. You know, it's it's poetic. Um, you've got <laughs> got to check out. We're not proselytizing, to be clear. It's just if you are interested in these kind of things, you can find you can find videos and lectures online, and you can also get some books. He is quite a prolific author. Uh, be do be aware that many of those books are transcripts of lectures that he's made. Look, okay, so there are all these. This has happened so often that there are even jokes and bits of folklore about it. You know, like the. Um, like the three guys in the insane asylum who are each convinced they're Jesus Christ and you put them in a room and you see if they eventually get along, right? That's the thing. Uh, it's not unusual to be loved by anyone. No, I'm kidding. It's not unusual to see people who believe that they, everybody wants to be special, right? Everybody wants to be extraordinary. So it is not uncommon for people to believe that they have been um singled out for some divine purpose and honestly again that's a personal belief there's nothing wrong with it you might find that other people don't agree that you are the main character of the universe because that might diminish their experience that's fine you can be a one person belief system millions of people over the years have claimed to commune with spiritual leaders from beyond the grave and if you look at happy sciences basic spiritual belief system and structure, there's nothing immediately dangerous. It's like, try to love in a giving way. Try to be honest. Work actively to make the world more peaceful and more joyful. All the hits, you know, the good stuff. Uh, until, that is, you get into their political arm, their political wing or branch, because unlike a lot of other spiritual movements, uh, they, they are heavy in politics. They do not care about separation of church and state. And the uh, political wing of, of the Happy Science Organization is known as the Happiness Realization Party. Um, you don't really throw that word around unless you're talking about something politically motivated and organized, unless like Mario Party or you know, pizza party, which are unequivocally great things. Uh, this is incredibly right wing in its ideology um, and much less warm and fuzzy uh, than the spiritual teachings might make you think it would be. Um, this organization supports the expansion of the Japanese military, uh, erasure of proven World War II war crimes like the Nanjing massacre, and is really hot to trot when it comes to getting the nukes amassing nuclear weapons oh it hates hates uh china like the whole the whole yeah. thing of china it's not one of those things where you say i know people don't control the government i may disagree with the government of a country but i recognize the people are human and decent and have the same wants and desires and fears no it's it's very um <laughs> oh, beep me, just because I love this. Beep me, Max. It's very, uh, they're very Tupac in this. They're saying, F China, and if you roll with them, F you too. That's basically it. And I'm not being too hyperbolic with the language either. No, there's some rough things you can find online statements. Uh, and again, there's so many videos, so, so many. much writing. You can find it if you look for it. He Doesn't he have the, the, uh, the leader, Rioho, he has... Or he, at least for a time, had the Guinness Book of World Records. I think he had a record for the most books published in one year. And the number was 54. Wow, that's great. I didn't know that. That's cool. That's a cool fact yeah. to walk away with. Uh, okay. Yeah, but like you said, it's transcriptions of like just 
talking and then it's put into a book. And he's freestyling a lot in those videos. You know what I mean? It's like one thought leads to the next. I don't think he has a script often, but uh, as of spring of 2018, uh, and this number may have changed a little bit, there are at least 21 local political officials in Japan who are members of the HRP, the Happiness Realization Party that uh, Noel just described there. And this article that made me laugh is from a journalist named Scylla St. Gully over at Vice. Scylla goes and visits a Parisian branch of Happy Science. And he says, okay, give me the scoop. Tell me, you know, I, I am all eyes and ears. I want to hear, I want to see. And you can tell that this is going to be a little bit of a snarky article, a snarticle, uh, through the title. Happy science is the laziest cult ever. Again, we didn't write that. No need to get the lawyers involved. No, no, no. I uh, so he goes and checks out this local branch, right? And <laughs> the lectures unexpectedly, I would I would think and say that the lectures are about extraterrestrials in part. They're also about this very specific viewpoint of reality and the afterlife and the connection between, you know, Earth and this other realm that exists in nine dimensions. And you can even I, I can't remember if if this author in particular found the actual sketch, like the diagram of heaven when it's laid out in these tiered dimensions. Yes. I think there are some prophets who only get to hang out in the eighth level, but then the ninth is like the VIP area. It's really, really interesting stuff. Oh, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a belief that Mr. Okawa and his followers subscribe to. And there's nothing wrong with having your own personal beliefs. But just like us, St. Gully notices a little bit of a discrepancy between this very huggy, lovey, inclusive language on the spiritual side of happy science and then the somewhat more militant geopolitical philosophy. I've had a hard time not laughing as we get closer to this because I love this excerpt. I love this quote. I feel like someone uh, someone else do the honors. Sure. Um, after the break, we were subjected to another tape, Rebirth of Your Hopes, a completely overt attack on China and North Korea, where Okawa characterized the two countries as, quote, responsible for the decay of Asia. Responsible for the decay of Asia. Okay. Um, there was a part where he started screaming about the Chinese being, quote, dumb, lazy, and full of shit. Okay. No hyperbole there. Uh, and another part where he claimed that the Japanese government was going to raise taxes because of the... Oh, good Lord. I, I don't know I, I just want to say this. I, okay, this is a quote. This man said this. This was reported by, by uh, St. Gully. Was going to raise taxes because of the, quote, Chineseing of their minds. Yeah. I don't know why that... Uh, that insult is that just string of insults calling someone dumb lazy and yada yada i don't know why that that tickles me so but he is very serious uh i and i wanted to ask you guys about chineseing of the mind is that meant to is that like a statement about communism maybe it does seem to be referring to some sort of indoctrination uh communism being the closest lowest hanging fruit I, I would argue. Which is uh, wild. I, I think China's hyper capitalist authoritarianism. No, <laughs> you're right. Like, who knows, man? The dude, I mean, we talked about him channeling stuff, right? In the in, there's a similar Vice video where you can watch, you can watch the founder in a like press conference like setting with some supposed reporters asking him questions while he's channeling the ghost of Margaret Thatcher, the spirit of Margaret, Th Margaret Thatcher. And it is one of the most surreal things you can see. Uh, he, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's more like an affect, like, a am I'm, I'm so possessed right now. That's what I, that's what it reads to me. If, if he was, if he was an actor and playing a part, uh, I'd be like, that's a little, it's a little much, uh, but <laughs> sorry, I don't want to, make fun of him it's just it the guy does some in some very strange stuff on camera and then purposefully puts it out as 
uh, messaging for his organization. And uh, the New York Times has written about him as well uh, fairly recently, just a few years ago in 2020, journalist Sam Kestenbaum went into detail about how happy science was approaching COVID-19. Again, you see a lot of these organizations spending a lot of time on their own interpretations of the pandemic because it was a global event, right? So Kestenbaum says that the group was claiming they could cure infections of COVID-19 through spiritual vaccines, the remote application of spiritual vaccines. So you pay insert fee here, and then you have a prayer directed at you. The idea is that that prayer will spiritually protect you from from, uh, contracting this physical ailment. So it's like a laying on of hands, almost like big tent revival kind of mentality. The idea that I can like inoculate you with a blessing, you know, or, or restore your ability to hear or walk or whatever by, you know, touching you or, or, or doing some sort of well, sending vibes, sending through vibes. Yeah. Camera. It's vibe based. Thank you. That's a much better way of putting it. Vibe based. Yeah. And this, you know, I, I think it's a worthy comparison because lest anybody in the West be too quick to judge, do remember that tent revivals and televangelists aplenty have have applied similar techniques or similar claims, at least. Uh, Kestenbaum seems pretty skeptical, just to be fair, uh, and says that happy science is an enormous and powerful enterprise claiming millions of adherents, tens of thousands of missionary outposts across the world, It's secretive, it's hostile to the media, and it's structured around a tiered pay-to-progress system of membership. They're sometimes called Tokyo's answer to Scientology, which is a comparison I haven't haven't thought of, but I I imagine critics would would agree with that, right? Um, Still, it's it's definitely it it checks all the boxes for a cultic organization. Yes, it does. Were you guys aware that there's a happy science branch in our fair city of Atlanta? No, but I'm not surprised. There is. It has four reviews on Google and it is temporarily closed, but there is a phone number associated with it. And you better believe I'm about to call it later. I'll just see what are their hours. Let's just roll up. It's temporarily closed, it says. Yeah. All right. We'll find them. But it's on Piedmont. It's on Piedmont. Wow, nice part of town, actually. Uh, so they're doing well. Really quickly, there's a there's a book by Nietzsche uh, called The Gay Science, um, and it's translated to the, the, the joyful science, the joyous science, or the joyful wisdom. Do you see any connection between the the uh, the the work of, of Friedrich Nietzsche and uh, and this, or is it just kind of a parallel? thinking coincidence it may be parallel because it's a very powerful phrase i think you know joyful science happy science uh but i am sure that uh mr okawa has discussed nietzsche or nietzsche and thought at some point just because he is so prolific he's like uh he, he reminds me of that guy we talked about earlier adnan oktar uh with the turkish sex cult and, and uh, attempted coup of Turkey. Uh, that guy was also very prolific. So I feel like at some point, it wouldn't be surprising, rather, if at some point in Mr. Okawa's writing or lectures, we can find comments about Nietzsche. And what was that the basis for his decision to name his movement this? That I do not know, but it would be really interesting to find that out. And by the way, uh, one note with Mr. Okawa Yes, always people with um, unorthodox or newer spiritual beliefs are going to be vilified by the status quo in the mainstream. So he's got a lot of outside critics. But it might surprise you to know that one of his number one critics is another Japanese cult. It's the one most Westerners think about when they think about Japanese cults. Am Shinriko, which we covered in a previous episode, uh, they had a very intense rivalry. I guess they're competing for followers, maybe. Or maybe it's just the thing where someone's saying, no, I'm the main character. You're incorrect. I'm the real Jesus. Or what have you. Anyway, before they made that horrific attack on the Tokyo subway, 
Alm also tried unsuccessfully to assassinate Mr. Okawa. Uh, like, like you were saying, Matt, Happy Science is around today. You can go visit their website for firsthand information. And while you may not have heard of this group, make no mistake, they're making some big waves around the world. Uh, this is going to end up being a two-parter for us. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, it is going to be two-part. We're going to have to end very shortly here. I just want to point out another commonality that I'm seeing with this group in particular and some of the ones we're going to talk about in next episode. The deification of that leader. Like, if, if you go to Happy, Happy Science's website, there are numerous videos and full books written about Okawa's uh, like birth to the story of how he was so intelligent. He had an IQ of 200. He was 12 years old, but he, you know, it's like he was 20 and uh, how he went to this prestigious university and then went to this other one. And it's just really, you can watch these videos with this very emotional, moving, triumphant music over top of it, you know, and just talking about this, this person. I think that's a commonality we see in a lot of cultic groups that put their leader in that space, right? Who is now Jesus or God or the next coming or whatever. Yeah. And I, I personally don't like deifying anybody. So uh, I don't know if I'm in the demographic, but, but yeah, you're right. It, again, it is the tactics that define what we would consider cultic, not the content of what they're saying. And we have, there's so much more that we want to dive into. Join us for part two our episode on up and coming cults, cults you may have never heard of yet. Uh, we're going to go into uh, some more strange territory, but uh, whenever we talk about stuff like this, we feel morally bound to end our episode with a little bit of a PSA. This is just scratching the surface. Is one thing for sure. There are many, many, many organizations that might not call themselves cults, but sure do a lot of things that a cult would do. And if you or anyone you know has been taken in by an organization that is emotionally or physically unsafe, please do not hesitate to reach out to any of the multiple resources online, over the phone, there are forms of plenty. They can provide free counseling and assistance. Um, it's worth it. And that's where we're ended today. What do you think? Do you have any experience with a cultic organization? I'm sure some of our fellow listeners do. People often told me that they didn't understand what they were in until they left and they looked back and they had that light bulb moment and they said, that was a cult. I thought I was just selling popcorn on commission. But now I was in a cult. Ah, no wonder there was a giant golden idol of this El Cantare guy <laughs> behind him at all times. So, yeah, I mean, we're putting levity on it. But, yeah, these things can be serious. So we would love to hear your stories. Uh, we can't wait to, to read them, to listen to them, to experience them. Please do not try to convert us if you are a cult leader. Otherwise, we're easy to find online. That's right. You can find us on Twitter, on YouTube, and on Facebook, where we have a Facebook group. Here's where it gets crazy. Join that thing. Uh, we exist on these platforms under the handle Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, you'll find us at Conspiracy Stuff Show. Check out linkter.e slash stdwitk. <laughs> if you want to look, that's our link tree. I'm being silly. Um, if you want to find how to pre order our book or come and check us out on the book tour, Coming to you in October. Hey, we also have a phone number, right? Oh, snap, you're right. Uh, these allegations are indeed true. Just give us a ring-a-ding-ding -ding banana phone where we are 1-833-STDWYTK. You'll, uh, you'll hear a brief message telling you you're in the right place. You'll hear a beep like so, beep, and then you will have three minutes. Those three minutes, they belong to you. Go nuts. Get wild with it. Go hard in the paint. And uh, while you're doing that, please let us know what you would like to be called. We love a good nickname or moniker. Uh, tell us what's on your mind. Second most important thing, let us know if we can use your name and or voice on the air. Most important thing, if you need more than three minutes, don't censor yourself. Don't edit yourself. Write us an email. Send us those links. Take us to the rabbit hole. We will dive in. We read every single email we get where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.